Well, hello again. I think it's time to continue our meeting. And now I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Ted Denson, who is a fantastic gastroenterologist, a fantastic clinician here uh, at the Children's Hospital Medical Center in Cincinnati. But he is also a very well-known basic scientist who spent quite a bit of his uh, life studying growth in children with inflammatory bowel disease. And since we are dealing with very similar issues in our patient population, we thought that he might help us understand how we could address some of these challenges um, in our group. Uh, Dr. Datsun. Well, thank you very much, Alexi, for that um, kind introduction. I'm delighted to be here today. I think there's some very similar things that happen between kids with inflammatory bowel disease and kids with arthritis that, that we can learn from. So what I'll um, go over in the next few minutes is effects of IBD on growth, but also on body composition and bone health. Uh, look at what tends to cause poor growth in children with IBD, and then review different therapeutic options that we have to improve growth. So we think about growth in IBD, we're thinking about three different things. Uh, we're thinking about linear growth, or how tall kids are getting. Oh, we're also thinking about body composition. How is their muscle doing? Um, you know, how is their overall body health doing? And we're thinking about their bone health, because oftentimes factors that affect linear growth often affect bone health, which can also carry over into adulthood. So it's really all three of those things together that we're looking at. So some of the things about um, height in children with inflammatory bowel disease, there are two types, Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. And it's really in the Crohn's type where growth is most affected, so that's what I'll really focus on. Uh, sometimes reduced growth can be the first sign of Crohn's. Um, if we don't uh, control it well enough, it can lead to reduced um, adult height. Um, steroids certainly make poor growth from the disease itself uh, worse. And it's really important to identify kids who are faltering early so that we can initiate eff effective therapies early and try to maximize their normal uh, growth that would happen during puberty. And we know for children that are, are severely affected in terms of growth, this can really have effects on their quality of life and their self-esteem. So there are three normal phases of growth and development in children. Uh, there's the growth that happens during infancy, uh, which is largely related to um, kind of health during pregnancy and right after birth. Then there's kind of the steady growth that happens during childhood, um, largely under the influence of growth hormone. And then finally, the, the growth spurt that happens during puberty under the influence of both growth hormone and sex steroids like testosterone. For children with Crohn's disease, at least, most of them are, are diagnosed early in adolescence, around age 11 or 12. And so they tend to have both kind of their childhood phase of growth and that pubertal phase of growth affected by their disease and affected by the therapies that they receive. If we look at a different way, what this chart is showing is how fast kids are growing every year. And, and all of these things I'll be showing going forward are showing pretty much the same thing, how, how many centimeters a child is growing each year. Uh, for girls, uh, they tend to have that growth spurt, which is illustrated by the increase in the dashed line, you know, around age 12 as they're going into puberty. And for boys, it tends to be a little bit later, around age 14. Uh, So-called late bloomers or kids with kind of um, constitutional short stature will have all this happen a couple years later, but eventually do catch up. What can unfortunately happen with kids with Crohn's is that both their growth spurt, particularly in boys, tends to be delayed by a couple of years. And then when it does happen, it tends to, to get to a lower rate. So ultimately, they can wind up shorter than they would have been um, without Crohn's. So everything I'll show you going forward will be, will be things that have been done to try to improve this yearly growth rate and really capture um, a normal growth spurt. And then if we look at kind of a regular growth chart with, with weight there on the bottom and height on the top, and the 50th percentile is the dark line, ultimately what can happen 
is that kids can wind up uh, much shorter than you would have predicted um, based on their parent site or where they were growing before becoming ill. Now, what about body composition? Body composition refers to um, your lean mass, um, you know, your muscle, and your fat mass. And both of these um, can be reduced in children with active Crohn's. But at least before the advent of the biologic therapies, the anti-TNFs like infliximab and adalimumab, uh, historically we saw that the fat mass tended to improve more uh, than the muscle mass with our standard therapies. And so then kids would ultimately wind up with reduced uh, muscle compared to where they would have been. And that muscle in turn is a significant contributor to your bone health. So if your muscle doesn't really catch up, your bones can't really catch up either. Now what about bone health? I think this is really almost as important as paying attention to linear growth. We know that in kids with Crohn's and arthritis or any other inflammatory condition, the disease itself and some of the therapies can reduce both bone mineral content and bone density. In the past in Crohn's, this was associated with higher rates of fractures during childhood. Um, both these kind of vertebral compression fractures that can cause back pain and then sometimes fractures in the arms and legs. Uh, these are fortunately much, much less common uh, with current therapies. But nevertheless, we do have some patients who wind up with um, suboptimal peak bone mass. So the same way you're building up kind of your height in adolescence into early adulthood, you're also building up your bone mass. And you really need to optimize your bone strength by early adulthood. Uh, so that's also something we keep a close eye on and monitor as our patients go into adulthood to try to reduce the risk of fractures later in life. So, so what are the causes of poor growth in, in IBD? And I think, you know, except for uh, malabsorption, because it's the intestine itself that's affected in Crohn's and IBD, really all of these would be the same uh, for a child with arthritis. Uh, the disease itself, through the inflammation, uh, causes the body to need more protein and calories every day. Uh, the rule of thumb is you need about 20% more when your inflammation and your disease is active. Uh, the inflammation itself will reduce appetite, so kids have a double whammy that they need more protein and calories at the same time that their appetite is being reduced uh, by the disease itself. Uh, things specific to Crohn's, um, particularly if it affects the small intestine, can be malabsorption or increased GI losses. And then they're, they're kind of the effects of the disease itself through inflammation. And as what Dr. Grom alluded to, there are two inflammatory proteins in particular called TNF and IL-6, which we block therapeutically both when we're treating Crohn's or when we're treating arthritis. And what we found years ago was that they would cause a state of growth hormone resistance in the body. So the inflammation itself makes the body resistant to its own growth hormone. And that plays a big role in, in the reduced growth. And then the corticosteroids, which are quite effective for symptoms and reducing inflammation, have effects of their own, which will also uh, reduce uh, growth and reduce bone health. So what can we do about all this? Well, we know that, that the steroids are a two-edged sword. They relieve symptoms. They will improve weight gain. Um, but at the same time, they tend to reduce uh, both muscle and bone mass. It's really just kind of the fat mass that the steroids increase. And they certainly will reduce your growth rate. And this is through multiple factors, but it's been shown that they can reduce production of growth hormone itself, which is needed for normal childhood growth. And they will also themselves make the bones somewhat resistant to growth hormone and another factor called IGF-1 that drives the effects of growth hormone and the, on the bones. And then they directly um, activate cells in the bones that, that resorb bone and make bones weaker. One thing that was used years ago uh, for Crohn's, which we don't use as much anymore, would be we found that sometimes we could combine our anti-inflammatory therapies with every other day steroids, and giving the steroids every other day would have enough of an anti-inflammatory effect without as many side effects. These days, uh, most kids um, are treated without steroids beyond the first 
few months after diagnosis. And this is just an illustration from one of my collaborators, Jeff Himes, from, from years ago, showing the effect of both the inflammation from the disease itself and then the effect of also being on steroids on growth rate. And I think, as you can see, in kids with kind of moderate to severe Crohn's with higher levels of inflammation, uh, that alone reduced their growth rate compared to kids with milder Crohn's. But then if they also needed daily prednisone, that profoundly suppressed growth, both in kids with mild uh, disease and really completely turned off growth in kids with more severe disease. Now, nutrition, um, the, the malnutrition in kids with Crohn's is due to three things. The poor appetite I mentioned, which is due to inflammation, uh, malabsorption from the small intestine itself, and then also the inflammation itself increasing the body's needs for protein and calories. Now, one therapy we use for Crohn's that, that isn't really used for arthritis because it's not an intestinal disorder is actually just using pure formula as the only source of nutrition for about eight weeks. And what's been seen with this in head-to-head in -head studies uh, with corticosteroids done years ago is that over eight weeks, either having only formula for nutrition or having steroids were equally effective um, in reducing symptoms. Um, but because the nutrition actually heals the intestine, it, it led to a much higher um, increase in height, as uh, shown here on the right, compared to controlling inflammation and symptoms with steroids. So, so these days, if our patients aren't responding to medicines like infliximab or adalimumab, the, the biologic therapies will go to this liquid diet to get the intestine to heal up and to kind of jumpstart things. But then really the key has been uh, the anti-TNF therapies like infliximab and adalimumab. And that's because they really control inflammation better than at least therapies that we previously had for Crohn's. And, and in the data from the original controlled trial, it was found that kids who responded to these medicines grew on average about an inch and a half uh, faster per year, uh, demonstrated catch-up growth and improved bone health. And this is really our mainstay these days, to advance this medication to the point that it controls inflammation and allows us to uh, treat the kids uh, without corticosteroids. And this is probably because it specifically restores the normal growth hormone signaling in the body. And then this is just a, a study published by Dr. Lovell here a few years ago in uh, Arthritis with a therapy that blocks another inflammatory cytokine, showing a imp similar improvement in growth rate in children in the first and second year after starting the therapy compared to beforehand, and then a slow increase in, in their overall height over time. So for us in, in, in IBD, this is really the mainstay. Now, around the same time that, that the biologic medicines like infliximab were, were coming to the market and were widely being used for Crohn's, we and others did studies of growth hormone with the idea that we might be able to uh, provide supplemental growth hormone and boost growth and improve uh, body composition. Uh, so this is our data from a very small randomized control trial that was done years ago. This was actually at a time when, when kids were flaring, they were treated with steroids as kind of the standard treatment. So all the kids that came into the study had active disease on steroids, half continued on steroids, half received steroids along with growth hormone, and then we looked at inflammation and growth. And what we found is when we compared the kids who came in and got growth hormone and their yearly growth rate and the kids who received only steroids, um, after just a few months, kids who were also receiving growth hormone had a significant improvement in growth rate compared to the kids who had only been on steroids. And then when the kids who were on steroids crossed over and also started growth hormone, they had a similar um, improvement in growth rate. And, and actually about exactly the same as what we see with the anti-TNF um, infliximab therapy. 
Now, one important point is because this was done at around the same time that infliximab was receiving approval, this uh, study did not include uh, children who were also on infliximab. Uh, it, the growth hormone was very well tolerated. We didn't have any kids who stopped it because of side effects. There were some mild uh, joint pains or, or problems with shots. A few kids whose uh, Crohn's flared, but none that really had significant side effects from the growth hormone itself. And then this is just a summary across um, studies from other groups in Crohn's that were done around the same time with a similar um, dose of growth hormone. And, and I think what you can see is if you look at the growth rate in blue here uh, before growth hormone and the growth rate in green um, after growth hormone, uh, the, the three other studies like ours with a similar dose all had a similar uh, improvement in growth rate. Uh, the one study that really didn't have an improvement um, used a, a different uh, type of dose. So I think that that was very consistent and, and this is something that we will uh, sometimes use as kind of an extra therapy if kind of our standard medical and nutritional therapies aren't working well enough. And then this is just um, information from a study uh, of, oops, there we go, a study in kids with arthritis uh, on long-term corticosteroids who received growth hormone, this was published a couple of years ago, um, showing, uh, and now this is kind of overall height, not growth rate, but actually moving up on your growth curve, uh, showing some improvement uh, on the growth curve and improvement in um, moving towards your target height. Although what was seen is kids did have an improvement in growth, but most, um, many, I should say, still wound up a bit short of what their uh, predicted adult height would have been, um, but certainly a beneficial effect. Now, one thing that's, that's really very different uh, between Crohn's and kids with arthritis is that even with much better therapies these days, about 20% of our patients with Crohn's do require surgery to remove that part of the small intestine that's causing their disease. And this can be maybe only a foot of small intestine, but it's so inflamed that it's uh, preventing growth and causing a lot of symptoms. And so what's been seen when kids have that um, surgery, uh, they, they typically have very low growth rate going into the surgery, and then, and, and then a very similar improvement in their yearly growth rate um, after surgery. Um, so similar to what we see with growth hormone and similar to what we see with the anti-TNFs like infliximab. But of course, these are in kids that have already received those medications and haven't responded well enough as far as their disease. So just to kind of wrap up, um, a suggested approach, uh, you know, carefully plot growth at all visits. Um, consider replacement of, of vitamins and minerals like vitamin D and calcium for bone health. Uh, meeting with a dietitian to ensure adequate intake, uh, regular DEXA scans to check bone health, uh, sometimes a bone age x-ray to see where a child may be in their development, and really to start all these approaches early. And then finally, just to sum up, at least when kids with Crohn's, it's really a combination of poor appetite, uh, the inflammation itself, and steroids that tend to suppress growth, uh, we consider effects on their body composition and bone health as well as growth. Uh, one thing that's specific to Crohn's that we'll use is this enteral nutrition or liquid diet uh, to control things better. Uh, our first line is to control the disease itself with medicines like infliximab or the anti-TNFs. And when those uh, don't work well enough for growth, uh, that's when we'll tend to add um, growth hormone as an additional therapy. Uh, thank you very much. We have time for one or two questions. So my daughter was on steroids for a while and suffered, well, she didn't go for two years, right? <clears throat> and my understanding, and, and, and so I don't really know, I'm trying to think of how to word my question, but 
um, we, we meet with endocrinology in Colorado, um, is that growth hormone, I guess, from your presentation, it, it, and, and I know you had 15 minutes to go over something that could be covered probably in about four days or something, right? Um, it almost makes it sound like, so the two questions I had are, number one, um, is growth therapy um, effective when a child is on steroids at the same time because that's what one of your slides seemed to indicate. Um, the second thing is one of the things as we've been working through with endocrinology in Colorado is that growth therapy can be tricky to time and make sure things work properly. Um, where I guess the, one, of the, one of the focal points maybe I got out of this is maybe it, it, it sounded really easy on the slides and in the studies. Um, could you maybe speak to the the use the usefulness or the what the effective the effectiveness of steroids with growth therapy, and then also the effectiveness of uh, timing of growth therapy in kids who are trying to catch up. Yeah, th those are two great great questions. So, um, growth hormone is effective in kids who are on steroids. Uh, that was the context of all those studies that were done in Crohn's in the early, mid-2000s. Uh, the mainstay in Crohn's, at least, though, is to control the inflammation um, and get to the lowest dose of steroids possible, and then if kids are still not growing, to consider growth hormone. Um, I think what the, your endocrinologist is probably referring to is you, as much as possible, want to mimic kind of normal phases of growth and normal levels of that IGF-1, which is how the body responds to growth hormone. But if you kind of monitor those, I think the dose can be adjusted to keep things in phase. And for example, not have a child grow too much too early and then not grow as much later, which might be something they were worried about. Can you hear me now? Yeah. So in, in your studies where you show that the combination of uh, steroids and growth hormone works, over what period of time did you monitor those kids? Because like, the slide showed 12 weeks, 24. It just doesn't seem like a long enough time spent. So I was curious yeah. whether so the, you did follow-up studies. Yeah, that's a great question. So those studies, um, I think, all went out to 52 weeks. And so we're long enough to start to see some catch-up growth. But you're absolutely right. Ideally, you would want to see it over two, three, four years, as some of the studies in arthritis have shown. Um, but those studies at least showed improved growth rate and catch-up growth out, out to one year of therapy. And, and typically, when we use this in practice, kids are on it for three or four years, and then we see the catch-up growth. So like kind of piggybacking on what they both said, a little bit, um, so so you're starting the growth hormones at a later age, then closer to like the 12, 14. Like we're not we're not starting it down at four, five, six years old, correct? Yeah, well, that's that's a great question. The question is about the age. Most of the kids in in our practice, and it's not as many anymore now that we have these effective steroid sparing therapies, are starting at around 11, 12, 13 when they're delayed and, and clearly, you know, much below the third percentile for height and much below their predicted height from their parents, where we want to have the four to five years to really try to catch up. Uh, very few really young children, um, unless there's some reason, other reason that we think they would benefit from it. <laughs> 